In this video, we'll explore the X Particles Fluid PBD Solver. We'll have a look at both the solver settings to get an understanding of how it works and also the fluid property settings so we can set up and create different looks. In this scene, we're going to use the XP Fluid PBD solver to create a fluid simulation to happen within this glass container. So we have that as collision geometry, and we have, if we have a look in our colliders folder here, we have an X particles collider tag, which has been applied to our collider geometry. And we have an XP Fluid PBD solver in our hierarchy. Now, the XP Fluid PBD doesn't require a domain it can um, simulate anywhere in the Cinema 4D scene it just needs to be active in our X particle system here so we also have this bit of geometry this yellow torus and this has been set up to be a particle emitter so with the XP fluid PBD switched off if we hit play you can see the particles are being affected by our XP gravity modifier and they're just kind of falling to the bottom of this geometry and kind of colliding with it and not behaving like a fluid at all. Each particle is just behaving as an individual entity which is being affected by the collider object and the gravity modifier. So if we get this same simulation, let's switch on our XP Fluid PBD solver. Everything is in its default state and we can hit play and you can see that we are getting a fluid solve. Instead of all of these particles just acting as purely individual entities, these particles are now influencing each other, and the result is that we're getting a fluid flow. We're getting splashes, we're getting ripples, we're getting currents, and they are interacting with each other to create this fluid volume. And if we just move the camera down, you can see that, look, we have half filled our container, the, the fluid solver is maintaining this fluid volume, so it's not compressing, and we have a fluid water body here. And if we just go to our emitter torus, let's go to the emission, and let's just double the emission time. Now we should be able to fill this volume entirely. So now we're getting loads more particles. They're working their way into the simulation. We're not emitting now. And we can see, yeah, look, we've managed to completely fill our volume. And we're not getting any volume loss of this uh, fluid body. So that's working as we would hope. All right, let's just put that emission back down to 20. And of course, we can introduce other X particles modifiers into this scene really easily. So let's say we want to get a bit more of a kind of a choppy feel to this. Well, look, we can activate an XP turbulence modifier. Let's just stick that on. And now we've got this really kind of choppy movement that we've introduced to our fluid sim. Look, let's activate this uh, rotator as well. And now we're going to start getting a bit of rotation, uh, rotational force. We can increase the speed of that to exaggerate it and now we're getting this rotation of particles around in our simulation and interacting with our uh, gravity and turbulence so very quickly we can turn a simulation into a really nice fluid simulation using the xp fluid pbd object so let's just switch off the turbulence and the rotator for now and have a look at our xp fluid pbd settings so with this fluid solver all of the settings are contained within the object itself. So both the fluid properties, things like viscosity and vorticity, that's done within the solver, and also the simulation settings are done within the solver. There are no separate emitter settings for the XP Fluid PBD solver. So we will explore a little later the object properties like viscosity and vorticity and see exactly how they work and what looks we can get by adjusting these. But let's concentrate first on the advanced settings, which are the simulation settings for this solver. And the way in which this solver works is very similar to XP fluid effects. The difference is that uh, fluid PBD solves for particle position rather than 
ve uh, velocity. So the, there are two basic steps to the calculation. The solver works out the particle position, and then it then works out what the fluid density value is based on that particle position. And if you have lots of particles in a particular volume, they will have a higher fluid density value than if there are very few particles in that same volume. If there is a high fluid density value, it will then um, cause pressures, which will then move those particles apart, which influences the next position solve. That position solve then influences the next density solve, and so on and so forth. So just like XP fluid effects, each particle is considered its own kind of separate individual fluid entity with its own fluid density value, but that fluid entity uh, influences the fluid uh, properties of its neighbouring particles. And that's how we get these fluid flows happening throughout our simulations. So let's have a look at one setting um, which we have in XP Fluid PBD. And this dictates um, the smoothing of those particle properties with neighbouring particles, how the smoothing occurs. And it's called the smooth radius. Now, to demonstrate this, what we're going to do is jump into another scene. So let's go to Window, and we will just go into a smooth radius scene. So if I just go forward a frame, what you can see is we have a number of particles. And you can see, look, we have these solid circle particles. Now think of these as our fluid particles. But now we've set this system up to have, so each particle has a circle particle on the outside, creating this kind of perimeter um, circle. So what this uh, particle is symbolizing is the smooth radius amount of each fluid particle. And we've set up a simple espresso rig on this, so every time we make an adjustment to the smooth radius slider, then the radius of our illustration particle will increase appropriately, so we'll always have a nice visual representation of this smooth radius amount. And it goes like this. If your smooth radius setting is set to 100%, then the smooth radius is always going to be three and a half times the particle radius. And we can see that in our illustration here. If we increase the smooth radius to, say, 150, you can see now, look, the smooth radius has increased. Let's pop it back down to the default of 100. So what is going to happen is this. As we play through our sim, each of these particles, when they are not inside the smooth radius of any other particle, are just behaving as individual particles within the system. So let's hit play. We've got a very mild turbulence affecting these. And you can see they're all independent. But as soon as they come within the smooth radius, look, their properties are smoothed. And in this instance, they are taking the exact same position. But this one's becoming very energetic. It's getting more and more particles within the smooth radius, more adjoining, and it's influencing the way in which that particle is moving, but it's also influencing the fluid density values of those particles. So there we can see that smooth radius happening. Let's just increase it to, say, 150. And let's see, now, now it's going to be very different. So the smoothing is going to happen over a longer um, distance because the radius is bigger but obviously it's going to be easier for more particles to fall within the smoothing radius of another particle and there we go if we reduce this smoothing radius down to 50 the smoothing is going to happen over a very short space but it's going to be more unlikely for those particles to go within the smoothing radius of each other look this one these ones have just missed each other uh, and here we're going to get one, and then it snaps into place. So let's put this back up to, say, the default of 100. Now, what we can see here is we're getting very erratic moving when our particles, uh, uh, fluid properties are smoothing. And one of the reasons for that is that we have very few particles in this fluid simulation. And that means that this fluid density value is going to be low. And with a low fluid density value, the forces which are then required to keep that 
fluid density get very large. And that's why we're getting this, what could be described as a pretty unstable sim. Because look, we've snapped two fluid uh, particles together with exactly the same position. So what we need to do is we need to damp down those very powerful forces which have been created to maintain that fluid density in a simulation like this. So what we can do is use the damping parameter to do this. So look, if we put our damping at 20, it's going to damp down those forces, which means we're still going to get that same smoothing, but the forces are damped, giving us a much more stable simulation. Here we go, look, much smoother um, smoothing of those particles. It's a much more uh, stable sim. So that's helping us. So if we have lots more particles in this simulation, there won't be as much damping required because with more particles in the same volume, they'll have a greater fluid density amount, which means that the forces needed to maintain that density aren't going to be as great. So let's go to our emitter. Let's set this up. So We'll switch off no intersection and let's just say, look, we'll put a thousand particles into our scene. So now we've got lots of particles. So the fluid density value is going to be greater. So there's going to be um, the forces aren't going to be as strong. So even with our damping down on 1% of the default, you're going to see that we're not going to get that snapping of intersecting particles. Um, they are kind of maintaining now this nice fluid volume, they're smoothing those fluid properties where necessary, and we're getting this nice cohesive fluid body. Now, of course, we could damp down the forces, and it'll make it behave slightly differently. But the damping isn't necessary to stop that very erratic um, movement when the, the fluid values are smoothed. And let's put that back down to one. And now we've got this fluid body interacting. So, of course, if we just quickly jump back into our original scene, even with a scene with a much bigger particle count, you can now see what is happening. These particles are having an influence on their neighbouring particles, which then have an influence on their neighbouring particles and so on, which is how we get this nice fluid flow and we get the momentum of these currents moving throughout the simulation because of the way in which we have this um, particle-to-particle particle neighbour smoothing based on our smooth radius value. OK, let's move back into our... Uh, more uh, macro scene here and we'll go back to our emitter and let's reduce this back down to what we had it down so we had it on about a, a shot count of 20 and let's um, keep our no intersections off for now so now we have far fewer particles let's go back to our xp fluid pbd so the next setting that we have here is check density which works in the same way as it does in the xp fluid effects solver and what this does is it prevents kind of explosive forces on particle emission because if you think about it if you have lots of particles being emitted into a scene and particles are being pumped into the same volume, suddenly those new particles are going to be given very high fluid density values, which is going to cause pressure, which will cause explosive forces. So what check density does is it looks at the birth density, the birth fluid density of those particles. And it, if, if, if that density is going to be greater than the density amount we set here, it is just killed off. So let's see that working. What we will do is have it switched off. We'll go to our emitter and let's go to our emission and let's just fire in, say, 2,000 particles. And what we want to do is count um, how many of those particles are born. So let's go to our emitter. We want to display the hood. So we'll go to the display and we'll go to hood and we'll go show hood. And then we'll go forward a frame. And of course, 2,000 particles have been born because there's nothing stopping 2,000 particles being born. But some of these particles are going to have been born in a high density state because they're really close to each other. So if we go to our fluid PBD and check density, it's going to kill off any particles which have been born with a density value of greater than 110%. So look, without that, we add 2,000. With it, 
we've got 1,331. So it's killed off just over 650 particles because its fluid density value is too high. And as a result, there aren't going to be as high a pressures in the scene, so you're not going to see as explosive a sim. So here's the sim with those particles removed using the check density. And it's a really smooth start to the sim, isn't it? And if we take tech density off, you can see, look, you can see that pressure that is created by that higher fluid density value, and it's forcing a more explosive start to the sim. Now, that may be a look that you want, uh, which is fine, um, but you're able to mitigate that by checking density, and now we haven't got that explosive start because we haven't got that high fluid density start point. OK, so just finally, what we'll do is we'll take check density off. We'll go back to our emitter. We'll reduce our shot count back down to 20. And let's have a look at our XP Fluid PBD object. So we have, by default, the solver is set to be in automatic mode. And in order, it's very robust, the auto mode in XP Fluid PBD. And what this does, it looks at your scene, at your setup, at your particle count and what is happening. And it will automatically adjust the sub-steps that are used in the solve, which are helpful to get an accurate position solve. And then the density iterations um, a set as well, which give you that accurate fluid density solve. And it is it's so robust that in most intents and purposes, you can leave this in auto and it's going to be fine for your scene. But should you wish to add more substeps and iterations to your simulation, you can by unchecking the auto, which obviously reveals the min and max for each. That's not something that we're going to explore in this um, training. And then the compression limit is uh, useful for when you are manually adjusting your min and max steps. And it basically dictates how many density iterations are used based on how much the fluid should be allowed to compress or not. Again, that is not uh, something we'll explore in this training. It's a more advanced technique. And finally, we have a strength slider. Now, the strength slider is the strength of the constraints that are used within the XP Fluid PBD solve. So with a very strong constraint at 100%, the constraints um, are uh, very, very strong. And the, the advantage of having a very strong constraint is that um, it really helps the fluid uh, prevent the fluid from compressing. But the problem with a very high constraint, and we can see it in our scene here, is that we're getting very kind of explosive movement as the particles are smoothed. So if we reduce this strength down to a very low number, like, like in most constraint systems, you'll get very little difference in the higher order of this percentage. You need to get right down to the lower percentages to see a difference. But if we put our strength down to 1%, you're going to see the um, effects of a weaker constraint. Look, you can see the constraint isn't strong enough to snap those into those positions and even maintain the position. Look, this one, the constraint is so weak, it's able to escape from it. But the advantage of that is it's reducing that explosive nature, which you may not want. The problem with having a lower strength value, so have these, these kind of weaker constraints, is that the simulation is much more likely to compress. And if that's the case, you're going to require far more fluid density iterations to um, stop that compression. And that's going to make your solve take longer because there's loads more calculations. So as always with fluid solvers, the um, the parameters are all kind of interrelated and have an effect on each other. None of them really work in isolation. But that is what your strength parameter will do, reduces the strength of those constraints used by the fluid solver. So again, most intents and purposes, it is fine to leave your strength on 100% in most use cases. If you're experiencing unstable simulations with or exploding particles, it could be a strategy to reduce the strength of those constraints, but as a result, to maintain your volume, you may need to have far more fluid density iterations.
In this scene, we're going to explore some of the object properties within our XP Fluid PBD solver, namely attraction, repulsion and external pressure. And these are the forces that are within our XP Fluid PBD solver, which allow us to create a fluid-like body of particles, but also make adjustments to the look and feel of those particles. So in this scene, we can see that we have particles being emitted from a piece of geometry. Let's just make, make that visible for a second. Uh, so we've got a nice bit of flower geometry. And we're emitting particles, if we have a look at the emission, in rate mode, so every frame for 60 frames. And if we hit play, you can see that they are uh, coming out and then we have an active fluid PVD solver, which is making them move in a fluid-like way. And we're getting some very interesting kind of tendrils and filaments with these uh, fluid particles. You'll also note that we don't have any modifiers active in the scene. There's no turbulence moving these around. There aren't any other type of dynamic objects or modifiers having impact on the movement of particles. So everything that you see here is coming from the fluid PBD solve. So the reason that we're getting movement in these particles, which have no speed, um, is that they are being born every frame very close to each other. And as we know from previous examples, that means that they're being born with a higher fluid density value. And XP Fluid PBD takes that fluid density value, which then creates uh, pressure, it creates forces, and those particles are moved apart, which then informs the next position solve. Um, and then in the next frame, more particles suddenly appear from that emitter within pretty much the same area. And so we've got some more higher density particles, which are then moved away. And that is causing this kind of nice organic movement out of particles. And then the solver's um, forces and object properties are creating the shapes of these blobs. So just before we move on to those and explore those settings, we're also viewing a colour representation of the fluid density. And what we're seeing here is the lighter yellow particles are the particles that have the greater fluid density and the pink darker particles are those that have the lower fluid density values. And the way in which we've set that up, we've gone to our emitter, to the display tab, and you can see that we have our colour mode of our particles set to gradient parameter. Here is our gradient, pink to yellow, and that gradient is being mapped to the fluid density value. And so the lower the fluid density, the particles will be pink, the higher the fluid density, the particles will be yellow. And if we have a look just on this still frame, we can see that that fluid density calculation is, um, is, is changing as the solver is going and making its calculations. And we can see that the uh, particles that are closer to other particles um, have a greater fluid density, they are yellow, and as they move to the periphery where there are fewer particles in a similar area, they have a lower fluid density value and so they are pink. So we can see that that fluid density solve is working correctly, it's doing its thing, and it's giving us this nice organic movement. And at this point, the fluid density is stabilised and we can see the internal particles within this fluid blob here obviously have a greater fluid density because they're surrounded by more. And look, our external particles, which have far fewer particles surrounding them, have a much lower fluid density value. So that's working nicely and correctly. So let's have a look at our XP Fluid PBD object properties. Now we are in completely default settings here within our XP uh, Fluid PBD. Apart from, we have just increased our viscosity level from the default 3 to 20%. Now the viscosity, will explore this more in depth in a bit. But this is just making the liquid behave like it's a more gloopy, thick liquid and it's going to make it easier to demonstrate what our attraction, repulsion and external pressure forces are doing. So this looks good and we have got this very nice fluid motion, but to properly explore individually what these forces do, what we want to do is take away all of this 
nice fluid motion that we're getting from that fluid density solve. And the way we're going to do that is to stop these particles being born every frame and being on, born on top of each other. So the way we'll do that, let's go to our emitter. We'll go to our emission tab and we're going to change the mode from rate to shot. So they're only going to be born on one frame. We've got it set to 10,000 particles. But we want to ensure that these particles aren't born intersecting. Not born, because that would mean that they would be born with a, a higher fluid density value and then that's going to create some movement in our solve. So let's just click no intersection, which means they can't be born in, in an intersected state within 3.5 centimetres radius. So now if we hit play you'll see that we have got some movement, but if we go to our XP Fluid PBD and take off all of these forces, attraction, repulsion, and external pressure, hit play, and we now have static particles because there are no forces working on these particles within our solver, and they all have a consistent fluid density, so they're not being moved around. All right, so now let's explore these different... Uh, forces individually. Let's put attraction on to the default 10 and what you're going to see is these particles will be attracted to one another but you may not expect the result that you're going to see. Let's have a look. So they're attracted but then they form little clumps and they fly off. So attraction is getting particles to attract other particles but there's not kind of a global attraction of our fluid. They're not kept in a one fluid blob by attraction. It doesn't work in that way. But we are getting the attraction, and then it causes these little clusters to fly away. So that's what attraction does. Let's take that away. And now let's have a look at repulsion. So if we put repulsion on the default 20, hit play, you're just going to see that slowly those particles are going to be repulsed. And there it is, no more movement. So, if we were to put attraction on 20 and repulsion on 20, what's going to happen is they're effectively going to cancel each other out. We've got two opposing forces at the same strength, and so nothing happens. They're just um, as they were when they were born. So to get fluid-like motion from these particles, we need the attraction to be lower than the repulsion and by default the attraction is set to 10% and repulsion 20. If we hit play all that's really happening here is we're getting a slightly slower rate of separation because obviously the repulsion force isn't um, as strong because effectively we have taken some of its strength away by the opposing attraction force but we're still not getting any kind of fluid like motion. Why not? Well, we need to uh, include into the equation the magic of the external pressure. And this is going to keep um, the particles more together as a whole, as a fluid entity. So let's put this on the default, which is 10. And now what you're going to see is the external pressure is forcing the particles as a group together and then we've got our attraction and our repulsion forces working together and we're starting to get some fluid-like blobby motion. Now we don't really have enough particles in this scene to see this properly so what we will do now that we have um, put them back to their defaults and we can see what these forces do individually and then what they all do together let's put our emitter back to the way it was where we had lots more particles and we were getting that nice kind of organic motion from the fluid density solve so let's go back to rate emission we'll switch off no intersection hit play and now we have got that nice movement and we have got all of these three forces working in conjunction to create this really nice look. And what we can do here is obviously make adjustments to attraction and repulsion for different looks. And what you're going to find is the wider the gap between attraction and repulsion, the thicker the tendrils and the easier it is for the clumps to break apart. So let's put the repulsion down even lower. Let's put the repulsion to 15%. And what you're going to see is lots more smaller clumps break off more quickly. And there you go.
Now let's put that repulsion up to, say, 80%, and you're going to see it's still a breakup, but it's going to be more difficult to break up, and they'll stay together more as a cohesive mass. Look, you can see we haven't actually had any breakaways at all, but we have created these nice holes, these nice gaps in the fluid, and we're getting these nice tendrils coming through as well. And obviously you can make small adjustments to the attraction as well and to the external pressure for vastly different looks. Um, but that is how these forces work in conjunction with each other to create different fluid flows where the particles behave as a fluid uh, but can kind of break away into nice separate blobs with tendrils. So let's have a look at a couple of comparisons here side by side, which will give us a nice idea of the different looks you can get just by adjusting, first of all, the attraction and the repulsion. So if we play through this one, you can see on the left, we have got much less repulsion and on the right, a much greater gap between the attraction amount and the repulsion amount. And the, the difference in simulation is quite striking. We've got um, these clumps, which are being allowed to separate much more easily with these long, thin kind of interconnecting um, tendrils and on this side we have a, a much more kind of cohesive mass of fluid particles still being able to separate creating these holes but not um, creating these long stretched out filaments like we have in this example so those are two very different looks and Secondly, let's look at our next one. So this is concentrating on various different external pressure values. Um, our other forces are set to the defaults, but here on the left we have external pressure set to zero, 10% on the middle one and 100% external pressure on the right. And you'll see very different simulations as a result. We're getting these particles um, being solved by the fluid solver. Of course, we have an XP rotator in here, which are rotating these particles round. And you can just see the difference in simulation that varied external pressure can give. Let's have a look now at the XP Fluid PBD vorticity setting. So in this scene, we have a container set up with our fluid inside of it. And you can see that we're viewing our particles in a elongated pyramid display mode. If we go to our emitter, let's go to the extended data tab. You can see that we've activated use rotation in ta uh, tangential mode. So these pyramids are always facing in the direction of travel. And that makes it really easy for us to see how this fluid is flowing. We can really see the direction of those particles as they're being moved around by these three collider objects. So if we go to our XP Fluid PBD, you can see that we have everything in default settings and we've got a nice bit of kind of fluid flow. And you can see as the fluid solver is doing its thing, we can see we're getting this really nice kind of uh, momentum. We're getting these flows happening. Uh, throughout our container there are some bits that are kind of swirled around and we can just see the solve doing its thing and it looks really nice but what we're able to do with the vorticity setting is to take some kind of swirling movement and kind of exaggerate that over time to get some really nice small tight swirling eddies so with our um, uh, settings in an identical form, what we're going to do is raise this vorticity from the default five way up to have a look at how different it looks. So let's just run through to say, we'll give this a bit of time. Let's run through to say frame 220 and we'll just pause it there. So this is with our vorticity set on the default five. Let's now put this on a really high amount. Let's try 10,000 vorticity. And we're going to come through to frame 220 again. And what you're going to see is we're going to have lots of pronounced tight vorticing swirls in this sim. So let's resim, and we'll run this through to frame 220 and we'll see the difference. So you can see already actually um, some of that vorticing happening, can't you? We're getting these swirls. So let's run it through to frame 220 and uh, yeah, the results are obvious. And there we've got nice, tight, exaggerated swirls in lots of different parts of this fluid sim. Uh, so vorticity is a simple but effective um, setting to add that little bit more interest and more detail to your fluid sim uh, simulations by adding some very nice swirly vorticing to your fluids.
You can create thicker, gloopy liquids using the viscosity setting in XP Fluid PBD. So in this scene, we have this emitter firing out these particles, which are pooling in this geometry. The geometry then tilts and the fluid pours to the ground and pools on the floor. So we have in our XP Fluid PBD settings everything on the default, and that's giving us this nice water-like fluid. So let's activate our second X particle system, which is exactly the same, but this time in our XP Fluid PBD solver, we have viscosity set to 60%. Let's run this, and what you're going to see is we've got pretty much the same simulation, but the pink liquid is going to be far more gloopy than the green, and you can see that we have definitely got a thicker, more gloopy liquid and it's all pretty self-explanatory. Now, if you start going above 60% in the viscosity, the force becomes so great that your simulations can become unstable. So if you require more thickness to your fluid than the 60% default will give you, the way to do that is to have more solver iterations. And there's two ways of getting more solver iterations. You can either go into your fluid PBD settings, change your settings from auto to manual and increase your minimum substeps and your minimum density iterations. That's one way of doing it. But because in this training we've kept this on auto the whole time, let's do the second way of increasing those iterations and that's through the Cinema 4D project settings. So let's hit Control D which brings up the Cinema 4D project settings. And within here, we have X particles project settings. And look, we can raise the global subframe steps from the default one. Let's put it on three. So there's going to be more substeps per, fr uh, per frame. And of course, as a result, there will be more iterations per frame. And the result of that is that we're going to have a much thicker liquid. So now once this tilts, you're going to see that that pink liquid is way thicker than it was in the default subframe steps because we have got more solver iterations going on. So as we see this gloop down, look how much thicker that is. And it's kind of glooping and almost snapping down and coiling as it's uh, dropping down onto that surface. So the viscosity settings in the XP Fluid PBD are simple, pretty self-explanatory, but very useful for getting fluid simulations and making them look thick and gloopy. One of the strengths of the XP Fluid PBD solver over XP Fluid effects is that it handles scenes with particles of varying radii very effectively. Uh, XP Fluid Effects works much better when all particles have the same radius, but not for Fluid PBD. And in fact, we can use this to get some interesting effects. So in this scene, we have an XP Fluid PBD solver, which is in its default um, form. And then we have three different emitters. And we have a piece of collider geometry, which is going to work as a container. So first of all, what we're going to do is emit our first particles which are on this yellow to orange gradient and we can see them filling up in our container behaving in a fluid like way we get this nice fluid motion and there they are and these are six centimeter radius particles let's now activate emitter two which are our blue particles and these are larger these are nine centimeter radius particles and if we hit play what you're going to see is that the larger particles are going to be floating on top of the smaller particles. And that's because they are have a larger radius, which means there are fewer particles in the volume compared to the yellow, which mean that they have a lower fluid density value. That means that the smaller, higher fluid density particles sink to the bottom of our container and our larger blue ones float on top. We can then introduce some more particles. Let's do our green emitter with 12 centimeter radius particles. And again, the same thing is going to happen. The larger particles, 12 centimeters, have fewer particles in the volume compared to the six centimeter ones. They'll have a lower fluid density value, which means they're going to float on top.
So it's a pretty neat trick to be able to simulate mixed density fluids. And we can also add some effects to this. So let's just keep it running uh, at frame 257. We'll increase the frames on our timeline. And we'll hit play so we're getting this nice sloshing fluid. Now let's activate this XP attractor. And we can see, look, the particles are going to redistribute themselves with our more fluid dense particles towards the attractor and then our row of less fluid dense particles on uh, the middle and our lowest fluid density particles on the outside. Let's switch off that attractor and then they will resettle in the appropriate position. So XP Fluid PBD can handle simulations with particles of varying radius value and we can use this to um, create a very nice and accurate mixing of fluid density simulation. The final parameter we'll explore within the XP Fluid PBD object properties is the blending option. So in this scene, you can see that we have three separate emitters here. We have a blue, a green and a red, and they are all emitting particles of a single colour. And you can see that they're all becoming part of the same fluid body, XP Fluid PBD is solving these uh, three particle emitters together to create this nice body of liquid. But what we're not getting is any blending of those colours, so we're not able to do a, a paint mix effect, for example. Well, that's where our blend parameter comes in. Depending on how strong this is, it will depend on how quickly these particles' colours are blended in a screen mode. So if we put this on 100%, they will blend very quickly. Let's hit play. And you can see that very quickly they blend until we get this kind of fully blended uh, murky yellowy colour. But if we reduce this down to, say, 34%, you'll see that obviously that's going to be a lot slower, that rate of change. And we're getting much nicer kind of mixing of fluid look. Let's put that down even lower to, say, 9%. And there they are, a really nice blend of colours so we can get these nice paint mixing effects. So it's important to note at this point that the XP uh, Fluid PBD's blend mode requires the particle to be one colour. So if we go to our emitter settings to the display options, at the moment our colour mode is the icon colour, but we could set this to single colour, for example, and this would work fine. The colour modes that wouldn't work with the blend option are any of the gradient from parameter uh, modes because that changes per frame so it won't work it has to be a single color so you can choose single color uh, we are using the emitter icon color as the color of our particles and in this mode it works fantastically to blend those different colors together for this mixed color look